What I'm going to do this afternoon is tell you a couple of stories and uh, there's a few, a few other slides as well, but just to try and explain why the approach that he showed they were actually using in East London, why it's different and why it's so useful. And so I'm going to start with a, a project. This was a real project. It's not one I was involved with, but it's one I've been told about. And it's quite an interesting one because it's, it, you can tell the story of this particular project, this improvement, by using a simple line graph, such as the ones that Amar was talking about. <coughs> So this is uh, a team that working in their medical admissions unit and they wanted to improve something. They wanted to improve the medicines reconciliation process because when they started collecting some data, they realised that they weren't doing terribly well. So in the, the, the baseline period when they were starting to, to look at this, you'll notice that um, their performance was between 30 and 50% of patients getting that process done right. And I'm hoping you're going to agree with me that that's not terribly impressive. I'm looking around this stage, looking to see whether I've got any nods or anything else to sort of... Uh, maybe you disagree, maybe this is brilliant, I, I don't know. Anyway, they didn't think it was any good. And they, 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 as they were collecting the data, because the way they had to do this, of course, was to go into the case notes and look to see whether, you know, what evidence they could find for this process. And they looked and they realised that what was happening was that the, the process was being done, but bits were being missed out. It was different bits were being missed out. So well, they came to the conclusion that what they needed was some form of checklist to remind people to follow all the steps. And so because they'd done a QI programme like the one that our start colleagues are doing over in East London, they piloted, they, they did small tests of change on the form, the checklist that they were going to use to make sure it was going to work. And notice what happened to their performance while they were doing that. It didn't change. But why would it, actually? They've only, what they've done so far is tested the form on a few patients to make sure the form is going to work. So they got to the stage of saying, yeah, the form's going to work. So now they implemented that. They printed the form, they put it in the notes, and they said, right, now this is available for everyone to use. We're going to use this from now on. And so they improved. Or did they? What do you think? Some improvement. And there's something else about the improvement too. They've got the same number for three consecutive months. So there's a sense of consistency a little bit. It's not bouncing around quite so much. The question is, have they succeeded? What do you think? Where do you want to be on this graph, by the way? 100%. Are they 100%? No, they're not. It's fairly obvious, isn't it? And that's what data can do for us, because it can tell us to what extent that bright idea we had, how well has it worked? So they need to do something else. So what's next? Well. And this is where we often go. We say, right, well, we've got a process in place, we have a checklist, people should be using but they're clearly not using it. They need to be reminded. And so the next change was the letter. Well, actually, it could have been an email, I guess, these days, from the clinical director saying, use the effing checklist. <laughs> or words to that effect. What impact did that have? Yeah, short-lived if you're lucky, yes. What did most people do with that email? Click delete. And why would that have an effect, actually? What's the implication behind doing that, that we don't care enough to do the right thing? Is that where you are? Do you come to work saying, I want to do a really bad job today, I want to screw up today? <laughs> no. I suspect none of us do. Do we? So there's an implication here that we're not really trying hard enough. Now, what they did next is important because what they did not do next 
was get somebody even more important than the clinical director to write an even more strongly worded email saying, do this or else. Which has happened in other organisations, I'm sure. Instead, they asked the question they should have asked at the beginning, which was, why? Why is it that people who want to do the right thing are not able to do the right thing, even with the checklist? And then they hit upon the notion that actually it was the junior doctors that were doing this. And junior doctors have other things to do all the time, at the same time. And so they realised that the problem was that they were being interrupted. And they forgot to go back, as all of us probably would do. I know that in your simulation suite here, you, you do technical training, but you also do human factors training. You chuck a few curveballs in and see what happens. And this is along the same lines. We need to design our systems to be able to cope with the fact that we are human beings and we are fallible. So they did something else. They put in a backstop that in theory shouldn't be necessary, but when they included this by including pharmacy to come and do a second check, look what happened. So what I've just done is use a very, very simple lie graph to tell you the story of that improvement. I've added a couple of things, haven't I? I've added the little speech bubbles to say what change did we make and when did we make it. And that's the power of the time series. It shows you what's going on over that time period and what impact the different changes have made. So, the difference one about improvement is that we use a time series chart, a simple one like that, with those annotations which tells the story about what happened on the ground. Because when I was started with that fantastic <coughs> performance report that he said was complete nonsense, part of the reason it was nonsense was divorced from what was going on on the ground. And with our time series, it helps us to link back to what's going on on the ground. And you notice that we've got two types of change going on here. They made two types of changes. The first type, we know what's going on from the process. The first change they made, the checklist, they got that idea from what they learned about the process. The change that didn't work so well was the second type. The last other email from the clinical director, what we think is going on from our assumptions. We assume something and therefore we say we're going to do this. Now sometimes our assumptions are right, but we really need evidence <coughs> before we take action. We need to know, and the data helps us to know, what is going on. So here's another question. Why is it that we typically present data month by month. Just pause at this point <coughs> and see whether anyone's got a bright idea. I bet you've never even thought about it, have you? It's just one of those things. We get data monthly. So how often you display and collect your data can have an effect on how you look at the results. So, this is my second story, and it concerns uh, a lovely lady I was helping out. She was a stroke coordinator in this hospital, and she was collecting data about a whole range of things about her stroke patients. One of those was how long it took her patients to get, once they were actually in a bed somewhere in the hospital, how long did it take them to get onto her ward? And she said, Mike, I'd like you to help me here. I've got all this data about my patients. And I've got the date they were admitted to hospital. I've got the date they arrived at my ward. And there are all these numbers. And I, I'm finding it hard to work out what's going on. And I said, fine, OK. I said, what do you want? She said, Just can you give me a graph that shows what the typical length of stay is that they're in hospital before they get to my ward, month by month? 
So of course, me being the obliging sort of bloke I am, I said, yeah, OK, I'll do that for you. And here's the result. What's it showing? Well, it's showing that in the first two months, months one and two, it's taking two and a half or three days to get to the stroke ward. On average, that's the average for patients admitted in those months. It was taking two and a half, three days. And then you can see in month three, the average dropped to about a day and a half. And by the time you got to month four, it's down to less than a day. And it seems to have stayed there. Now, there's not a lot of data on that graph, but it looks to me at face value as if something has changed. So I asked her the question, what did you do? And do you know what she said? Well, of course you don't. You weren't there, were you? <laughs> she said, I don't know. OK, now, remember who this is, is talking. It's the stroke coordinator, the person whose job it is, amongst other things, to get patients onto the stroke ward and make sure they get the treatment they need. If she doesn't know what change has happened, what change has been made, then we're in big trouble. So I said, OK, let's look at the data slightly differently. Now remember, she gave me the data about every single patient. I could have plotted you a graph patient by patient. Couldn't I? I'm not going to. But I could have done. She wanted it month by month. Why did she want it month by month? I suspect because that's what she was used to looking at. It doesn't actually say anywhere, to my knowledge, in the NHS constitution that we must present our data monthly. So why do we? Custom and practice. So let's look at it differently. Let's look at it week by week instead. So the next graph has a few more dots on it than this graph. This has seven dots. The next one has 31 dots. Okay. Now, you're all intelligent people, I'm sure you'll cope. Week by week. Okay, lots of dots, but I bet you notice something. What do you notice? Do you notice this week here? It sort of stands out, doesn't it, really? That's week six. And she's observant lady, and she spotted that one as well. She said, Mike, what's that week? What's week six? I said, it's the middle of February. So what happens every year in the middle of February? Half term, yes. OK, when she was on leave. Oh, she's got kids. OK, so she was on leave that week. And the next week she said she wanted to know about was this week here. It wasn't necessarily the next highest, but compared to the weeks either side of it, it sort of stands out, doesn't it? That's Easter. Yeah, well, well done. You're, you're doing well. When she was also on holiday. OK, so here we've got it. When she's on holiday, you get a performance like that and like that. So what's the answer? <laughs> this is the caring NHS we work on. <laughs> and I'm out every holiday, yeah. Or perhaps put a bit more constructively. <laughs> find someone to do the job when she's not there. Ooh, what an idea. You see that in the weekly data. You don't see it here, do you? It's hidden in the monthly data. So disaggregate your data. Don't plot it monthly unless you have to. You've got no other alternative. Plot it more frequently. Weekly is often a very useful frequency, but sometimes you might want to plot it day by day. Sometimes you might want to plot it hour by hour. Sometimes you might want to plot it patient by patient. It just depends on what you're looking at. The more you plot the dots, the more the patterns and the special causes emerge. So, 
Difference two, aggregate at your peril. By aggregating our data, we often hide useful information and therefore decide the best frequency to plot your dots over time. What makes sense from the data we are using? And weekly is generally better than monthly for operational data. Okay, so here's the next question, and this one comes right back to what Amar was talking about. Why is it the way data is presented is so confusing? Because the way we do present our data actually has a crucial effect on how we react to it. So, here's a lovely graph for you. Are we getting better or not? Okay, we haven't got a lot of time, so I'll skip over the answer and say that if you want to plot data over time, which we're trying to do here, do not use bars. Why don't you use bars? Because the bit of the bar that we're interested in, the bit that we compare to this scale here is what? A little tiny bit at the top. And we've got all of this stuff in the middle here that draws our eye away from that and makes us therefore work against the way our brain naturally works to look at the top. Don't use bars if you're plotting data over time. Use lines and certainly don't do this. That's a time series too. But it's really difficult to see whether there are any trends or anything else going on in that data and the trouble with the red amber green is what does it do? It focuses on the red. The red in red amber green charts is completely arbitrary. Someone has decided there's a cutoff. Above it we're okay, below it we're not. It reminded me of this quote from David Copperfield which I'll let you read. So Charles Dickens quite an observant <laughs> man. It's probably a bit more up to date what we're essentially doing with this we're okay, we're not okay. We move from benign neglect, when the number is green, to blind panic, when it turns red. And we flip between those two states. Benign neglect, blind panic. Neither of which is actually very helpful. So what do we want our chart to tell us? We want to tell us about what our performance is like over time, notice the variation, before we made our changes. We want to track what's going on during our changes and we also want to know what happened after. Have we sustained? It's nice to see the charts that Amar was presenting showed sustainable changes in many of his charts. So how does that work in practice? Here's a some real data from a real ward, a different organisation to Amars. And this is a, a ward where, adolescent ward, where a family, the idea was that if there's an incident that the family should be given feedback on the same day that that incident occurred. And how often was that happening? And you can see in the initial period of time it was happening around about half the time. And so they trialled something on that particular week. And in the trial week, that, that worked really quite well, and they were quite happy with it. So the next point on the graph is they implemented this uh, in the nine to five shift, this particular change, which was nominating a particular person to undertake to make sure that the family had got the feedback. <laughs> so you can see that the week that they implemented it properly, they did even better than the week that they tested it, and, and generally better, they think, than what they're doing so far. But of course, that's just one week. It's not enough yet. What happened the following week? This is what happened the following week. 
this. The change is implemented now. Look what happened. Why was that? They asked the question. Why? What happened? Why did it not work as well as we thought? Because the person who was nominated to do the role wasn't part of the project team. Didn't really understand what they were supposed to do. So the lesson they learned from that was let's have the role description to make sure everybody knows when you do this job what exactly are you supposed to do. They took a little while to get going but eventually you can see what their performance was. The final point to mention was here. In that week, they didn't have a person dedicated to the role for various reasons. So their performance dipped a little bit. But it didn't dip very much, did it? That graph tells the story. And that was a graph produced not by some information professional, but by one of the nurses working on that ward. She collected the data, she constructed the chart, she annotated it. It's her work. This isn't something you need information professionals to do, any of us can do it. So, track your data over time so you can see the variation that occurs. And base your decisions on real insight. Distinguish between the ups and downs of the normal process and the signals caused by real change. And so finally, um, if you want to know a little bit more about that approach to measurement, there's a video which uh, we created when I worked at the NHS Institute. It's about 10 minutes. It's on YouTube. So put my name and measurement into the YouTube search box. Or there's that link as well, which you'll have access to the slides, which tells you about the measurement approach that I've been telling you stories about to some extent this afternoon. And finally, three T's. Tell a story with your data. Think about the frequency with which you plot your dots and track over time. Thank you very much.